welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you and bless you and praise you, give you the glory and honor for what you're doing in all of our hearts and all of our lives. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts this day. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. As you bless us this day, Lord, we would ask that you would bless all the churches in the Inland Empire's well as around the planet that preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God for Square Denomination. Thank you for Ecclesia Church and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity in the way. And we thank you for San Bernardino Temple and Father, we just bless all the churches, our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers, together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. So may all the praise and glory go to you, Father. We thank you that this day we honor you. It is our holiday. It's not a government holiday. It's not a celebration of what someone has done or not done. This is a celebration of life that we have because of Jesus. It is our holiday and we thank you Father for it. In Jesus mighty name with a great big shout we all say Amen. Amen. Well as you take your seat get your Bible out go with me to Romans in the first chapter. The title of the message is called Good News from an empty tomb. A lot of times we don't realize that as we step away from Hebrews that we're going to go into a message this Easter about what this crucifixion and resurrection really means to you. What this empty tomb should say to you every single day of your life. I don't mean to be rude, I don't need to be crude, I don't need to be unkind. But I got news for you, Buddha's tomb is still full. (laughs) Mohammed's tomb is still full, and I don't care what they say. But Jesus Christ, the tomb is empty. That proves that he is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. But it proves more than that. Did you know that the crucifixion and resurrection in that empty tomb says a lot about you? A lot of times we don't see this because we exalt Jesus and we do. And we need to not take light or make light of what he has done on that cross and in that tomb. We thank God for what he's done. Don't misunderstand me. We we praise him for the rest of eternity because of the eternal work of the cross. But yet did you know that that crucifixion, that resurrection, that empty tomb says something about who you are says something about your future. Many of you don't even know you have a future. Many of you don't feel like you're gifted or talented. Many of you feel like God has overlooked you. You even wonder at times if God even knows you're here. But did you know if you were the last person on the planet, Jesus Christ still would have gone to the cross for you. And he would not have gone to the cross if you weren't around which makes you, by the way, the most valuable commodity on the planet. That means that other people can tell you how lousy you are and stupid you are. You can even tell yourself how stupid and ugly you are and how you're not into it and how you don't know how to make things work and how you just don't fit in like everybody else. But I'm here to tell you something. If you know the truth about who you are and know the truth about who you are in Christ Jesus every day of your life, you can say the tomb is empty and the reason for that is because of me. It's empty because he rose from the dead to prove not only that he's the son of God but so am I hooked up with him and there was a purpose and a reason behind it and I am the most valuable commodity on the planet that's what you ought to say every single day of your life 
All of us that are in here need to know and recognize the truth because we're barraged on a constant basis to try to stop us from being what we are and what God has called us to be. Every time that something happens, every pressure that comes against you, everything that tries to knock you off track and stop you from being what God would have you to be and hold you back from being all that Jesus Christ paid the price for you to be. I want you to know something. You've got to rise up and know a fact. The fact is that you're valuable. The fact is there's a plan that God cares about you. He went to the cross for you and the tomb is empty because and for you. And that's a very valuable thing for all of us to remember every single day of our life as we evaluate life and look at it to see whether or not we're going to fit in or not fit in. Let me tell you something. You may not fit into the world, but you fit into the plan of God. And you can either fit into the world or fit into the plan of God. And it's your call where you fit. It's your call where you fit. You know what I'm talking about. That's better. For every one of us, I want you to go with me, if you will, in the first chapter of Romans, starting in verse number three. I'm going to take you through a scenario. The scenario is Jesus. The scenario starts with him being crucified, resurrected, the tomb is empty, declared to be and proven to be the Son of God. What does that mean? Then because he's the son of God, the same power that raised him from the dead brings you into the picture. That same power that raises Jesus from the dead, the tomb is empty because of the power of the Holy Spirit brings you into the picture. Now listen to this. And then when he brings you into the picture, he blesses you, his promises are yours. There's a plan, destiny, and a reason for you being on this planet. Let me say it one more time. There's a plan, there's a reason, there's a destiny that you have on this planet. If you don't know that, here, here it is. If you don't know that, you won't do anything about it. You will just stare at Jesus. You will know who Jesus is and never fulfill what the future has got for you. God wants to bless your future. If you don't know that, if you don't believe that it never works let me give you an illustration of what I'm saying if I gave you a billion dollars put it in your name put it in a bank account but I didn't tell you what bank didn't tell you how to access it didn't give you the code to get to it you don't know where it's at it's yours you would have a billion dollars but tomorrow you will be as broke as you are today because you don't know how to get it God gives you everything that you need to have because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that empty tomb because he was raised from the dead by the power of Christ. He gives you everything you need. But if you do not know how to access it, you will sit in poverty for the rest of your life. You will die. You will go to heaven, thank God. But it'll be like you're on hell on this earth. Instead of being the blessing that you could be, you would walk around as if you were the cursing because you don't know how to access the account that God's given to you. And that's where we're going today as we look at the Word of God. First, Jesus first, because you got to know this without a shadow of a doubt. Verse 3 of the first chapter of Romans says it like this, concerning his son, I love this, God the Father, his son, not just me, not just you, but talking about Jesus. His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. You say, what does that mean? That means he was all man and he was all God. Thank God he wasn't just all God. Thank God he cared enough to identify with you and identify with me. He is all man and all God. Do you know what that means? According to the Bible, you have a high priest that knows about when you hurt, understands your pains, understands your frailties, understands your decision-making process, understands the good, bad, evil, tough, tough times, and good times, understands the feelings of a human being. He's not just God in heaven. Now he has literally been a man and understands the feelings that you have. That's why he's long-suffering. So first Verse number three talks about him being all God and all man. But verse number four comes along. Listen to what it says. And declared to be the son of God with power. Listen to this. Declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. 
It's not just somebody making a statement, this is my son. He proves this is my son by raising him from the dead. Are you hearing me? With the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, words are cheap. We've all heard words all the time of our life. We've heard people make promises and break promises. We had people tell us stuff that never followed through. But I'm here to tell you something. Words aren't cheap with God the Father. God the Father makes a statement. This is my son. I'll prove it to you. I'm going to raise him from the dead. Oh, my goodness, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is declared by God the Father to every doubter on this planet, every loser on this planet, every sinner on this planet, that Jesus Jesus Christ is the hope of the planet and the hope of the world because he is the son of God and the proof is that the tomb is empty. Come on, somebody. Now, we could just stop right there and you would know about Jesus, but it's not good enough for you to know about Jesus without knowing what it is you're supposed to know about Jesus and you and how you relate to Jesus and how Jesus relates to you. So as we look at the word of the Lord, I'm taking you now to the first chapter of Ephesians. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. As he writes to the church at Ephesus, he makes some statements under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as he does, he makes a statement about you and he makes a statement about me, talking about Jesus. Listen to these words, verse number 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? You've got to know it's the power of the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead. That's great for Jesus. The tomb is empty and we shout hallelujah. But notice what it says. What is the exceeding greatness of his power? How? Towards us. Who believe? Let me say it one more time. Get the picture. He's no longer talking about Jesus being raised from the dead, but he's talking about the same power that raised him from the dead. It's not just normal power. Notice what it says exceeding greatness of his power. Exceeding greatness. It is great, but it exceeds the greatness that you and I can imagine. That same power, what is it towards us who believe? Listen to this. According to the working of his mighty power. In verse number 20, which he worked in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at the right hand of the heavenly places. And all of a sudden now he identifies it's the same Holy Spirit power, this exceeding power towards you who believes it's the same power that raised him from the dead and sat him at the right hand of the Father. Verse number 21, far above all. Everybody say all. all. Not just some. Everybody say all. All. Not just a few, everybody say all. all. Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only of this age, but of that which is to come. Notice what it says. It goes on and makes this statement. And he put all things under his. Notice the capital H on the word his. It's talking about Jesus. Put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. He gave him, Jesus, to be the head of the church. And he put all things underneath his feet. Then the very next line speaking about the church, that's you. That's me. In verse number 23, the very next line, it says, which is his body. It says he put all things under his feet, which is the church. Listen to this, made them his church, but he's the head of the church, and we are the body. Everything that would try to stop Jesus, everything that would try to stop you, is now in subjection to Jesus, is now under the feet of Jesus. The problem with it is, is most people don't see that. Jesus, look at me now, is the head. And when you're born of the Spirit of God, you are the body. And if he's underneath the feet, the devil, trials, pressures, temptations, underneath the feet, they're underneath me. 
So it's not only underneath Jesus, who is the head, it's underneath the body because the feet are down there and they're underneath my feet. I don't have to put up with it. That's why the Bible says what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No principality, no power, no ruler of dominion, no ruler of darkness come against you, take from you, rob from you, steal from you, unless, unless, unless you let it happen. Are you following me? Who is his body? And then it says the body is what? The fullness of him, capital H, Jesus. The fullness of him, capital H, Jesus, who fills all in all. That's pretty powerful. Let me tell you what just got said. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead that made the tomb empty. That same power now takes Jesus and puts him into a spot as the head of the church and all things are subjective to him. He's over them all. They're all underneath his feet. He's now made the church the body. He is the head. That means all things are subjective to me if I know what I'm doing and how to do this. Are you following me? If I don't know how to do it, I won't do it. If I don't know how to work this, I won't understand it. It doesn't work. Let's go, if you will, to the second chapter, verse number one. The same thought is taking place. It goes right from the first chapter to the second chapter. Watch this in second chapter, verse number one. And you, he made alive. I mean, if there's anything you ought to circle in your Bible, and you... He made, some of you feel like you're dead all the time. You don't feel like you have any hope. You don't feel like you have any future. You don't feel like you have any destiny. You're just down, out. People have squished you long enough. People have tried on you long enough. People have been against you long enough. You don't feel like you're alive at all. But I'm telling you that's a lie. It needs to be underneath your feet. You are the body of Christ. Listen to this. And the Bible makes it very clear that he has not left you dead. He has made you alive. You used to be dead listen to the verse, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Do you know what dead in trespasses and sin means? You are dirty, rotten, gutter-sucking sinners. Uh, I wasn't. <laughs> we all were dirty, rotten, gutter-sucking sinners. Are you following me? We were dead in our sins. We were following the devil. Whatever he said, he did. We were hung up on every addiction you can think of. We had it all together. We were so stupid, we didn't even know we were in sin. We didn't even know anything about it. And here comes Jesus in his long suffering and love for us. Guess what? And redeems us. Oh, glory to God. And makes us alive. And in verse number two, he comes along and he describes the sin we are in, in which you once walked according, once walked, you're not supposed to do it anymore, once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit who now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once, once used to be past tense, conduct ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and, and where we were nature, by nature children of wrath just as others. But I like the first two words in verse four, but God. Hey, you and I were screw-ups, but we had this God who loved us, who came back. He's all God. He's all man. He understands your feelings, understands your frailty, understands your mistakes, understands your pains, understands your weakness. He comes back with a long suffering, realizes you and I are screw ups. Therefore, he does what? Takes us out of our dead relationship with him by the blood of the Lord, brings us into life so that we can be the body of Christ and all things underneath our feet, fulfilling the plan of God for us on this planet. Somebody ought to say amen. But God, every day you're going to wake up and say to yourself, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Two words, but God. 
I don't know how the family's going to make it, but God. I don't know how I'm going to love my husband, but God. I don't know how I'm going to love my wife, but God. I don't know how I'm going to deal with the relatives, but God. I don't know where the money's coming from, but God. I don't know how my boss is going to treat me, but God. I don't know how I'm going to make it with that much money coming in, but God. I want you to know something. When you know God is in there, you are one person who can nobody can stop because all things are possible to him that believes. Come on now. Now let me show you something which is really fascinating. I'm going to take you just a little bit empty, uh, just a little bit further. We're going to talk about that empty tomb. That empty tomb represents who you are in Christ Jesus. It's about you. It's about what God has for you. It's about God having a plan for you. Now watch this. It would be terrible for me to tell you that God has a plan, God has a purpose, without showing you how to bring the plan into your life without showing you how to bring the purpose into your life. I don't want to stand before you, get you to shout and clap. That's not what this is all about. This is not some kind of spiritual entertainment, even though I love it when you clap and shout. I want you to keep on doing it. I don't want you to stop, but I want you to know something. That's not what this is all about. What it's about is that you understand what's it going to take to get that check written because I need to draw upon the power of the blessings of heaven. And if you don't know how to access heaven's blessings, you will never get them. You will stay all the rest of your life never doing anything. So I'm taking you to 2 Peter. Let's go there. 2 Peter in the first chapter. And let's take a look at it. Are you listening at all today? We're talking about some great messages that are coming out of an empty tomb. And here it is in 2 Peter. Listen to what it says, talking about every single one of us once again. Verse number two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You didn't get it, so I'm going to say it again. Think about what this verse is saying. Remember how I said I could give you a billion dollars? And if you don't know how to access it, you'll be as broke tomorrow as you are today. Now watch this. God's given you everything. I'll show you that right now. But if you don't know how to access it, you'll never have it. First of all, see the first three words, grace and peace? Did you know that you live all your life for that? You work all your life for that? You work until you get to a certain age where you can retire and hopefully you have enough money. Hopefully you can go, you know, buy yourself a motor home or whatever, cruise around, let young people give you a finger as you're going too slow down the freeway. <laughs> you know, you're always looking for something to rest on and peace in, you know what I'm saying? You're looking for that peace every day. That's why you work. That's why you go to work every day. Here God says, grace and peace be multiplied in you. Don't you want the multiplication of grace and peace? In other words, if I could give you a little grace and peace or multiplied grace and peace, which would you want? You would say, I want the multiplied grace and peace. Well, how am I going to get it? Notice those words. In the knowledge, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In other words, you're going to find out the more that you know about God the further you can go with God. Are you following me? If you don't know anything, you won't do anything. Are you following me? Let's go on in the verse. Listen to these words. Verse number three. As his divine power has given to us all things. Does your Bible say all things? It does. His divine power. That's that same godly power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the same godly power that caused the tomb to be empty. That same power that's on you has given you, listen to this, given us all things. All things. Well, that's fine. What do they pertain to? Pertaining to life and godliness. Everything you'll ever need for life. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a man standing in front of you today? You never had this in school. You never had it in college. You never had someone stay in front of you and make a statement to you that everything you need in life 
Here's where it's at. You never had anybody ever tell you that. Now there's a man standing in front of you reading from the Bible telling you that the divine power of God has given us all things, not some, pertaining to what you really want, life and godliness. And therefore, you have now access to life. Did you know you can be alive or you can be dead? You can be excited or you can be depressed. You can be up or you can be down. You make the call to where you're at. Here God says, I have given it all to you. And then he tells you how to get it again. Second verse, second time. Through the knowledge of him who called us by the glory, uh, by glory and virtue. Now listen to this. Twice he said by the knowledge. How far you go depends on how much you know. And it's that simple, my friends. So a lot of times we know about Jesus, but we don't know what Jesus has done for us. And we don't know how to apply what Jesus has done for us. And we don't know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we don't know what we have access to. Two, and we don't know what God has done. Just recently, a great superstar singer died of an overdose of drugs. When you heard her funeral ceremony, you knew without a shadow of a doubt this woman was a Christian. In fact, some friends of ours in Australia just got through seeing her in concert. And as they saw her in concert, they said her voice was gone. But the last part of the concert, she stopped and she preached about Jesus. Well, you can say anything you want to say. Can I tell you something? If you don't know how to access the principles of God's word to fight off all of the demonic garbage that comes at you, then you will know about Jesus, die early, go to heaven, and you could have had a fulfilled life in everything. Instead of dying in your 40s, you could have died in your 70s or 80s, preaching the gospel all over the world. If you only know about Jesus, who he is, if you only know that Jesus died for you, went to the cross, and the tomb is empty, and you never know what that meant to you, you'll never access the giftings and blessings that God has given you. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. And for some of you that come to church, the only time you come to church is Easter or Christmas. And every now and then, once in a while, I'm not trying to pick on you. I love you. But stop and think about it. If this is what true, divine power on your part, which you need, listen to this, and given you to pertaining to all things in life, listen to this, and you don't know how to access it because you don't know nothing about God other than the simple stuff. You don't know how to use the word. You don't know what the word says. You don't know how to, abs- let me say it like this. Jesus set you free so the truth can make you free. Now, Jesus set you free. Hey, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. I'm going to heaven. Ah, ah, ah. But if I don't know the truth to apply it in my marriage, home, finances, dreams, vision, then I'll never be free in those areas. Yeah. Are, are you listening to me? And that's what he says. Who called us? Now, listen to this. Verse number four, just for fun. Watch these words. By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of a godly or divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Man, the world has failed. You can escape the failure, and you can be a partaker of the divine nature of God. Can you imagine that? Some people say, well, I don't care. Well, then you're not going to be a partaker. But for those that want to be a partaker, want to be blessed, want to live successful, want to be happy, want to be fulfilled, want to stop being the dog that's down on the ground instead of being an overcomer and the victorious person that God's called you to be, you ought to give God a great big shout if that's you. And today, it's your call. Nobody can do this for you. It's what you do. I can only present it to you. I can only say to you today the tomb is empty. And because it's empty, it's speaking of the power of God. 
the power of God not only to declare that Jesus is the Son of God, but it's the power of God that dwells on the inside of you, that changes life, that brings forth. But if you don't know it, you can't use it. It's like a kid getting in a car saying, I'm going to drive, but you're only 14, don't have a concept. You need to have a key. You need to turn on the engine. You need to put it in gear. You don't know the process. You'll never get the car going where you need to go. And so it's the same thing with all of us. We ought to spend time every week finding out more and more about God so our marriages will be successful, our homes and our families will be healthy and happy, our children will grow to serve the Lord. My goodness, that's real prosperity. So every day the tomb is empty which means you have access to the power and blessings of God. God's promises to you are yes and amen. But you got to believe him because the Bible says all things are possible to him who believes. Come on, if somebody in this place heard something from God, give the Lord a great big praise. Do we do that? But let me have your attention just for a few more moments. Because I tell you what, nothing could be more important than these next few moments in your life. Here's what I want to say. Here's what God would have me to say to you. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that we should check ourselves out, make sure we're right with God. Make sure you're right with God today in the next few moments. Nothing could be worse than you coming into the house of God seeing and hearing the worship, singing and clapping your hands, listening to the word of God like you just did, getting something out of it, man, that's cool. But I want you to know something right now. Nothing could be worse if you walk out of this building, head to your car, and your heart stops and you die, and you go to hell. You open your eyes after death and you're in hell. Nothing could be worse. I don't want you to do that. I know you don't want to do that. But I want to make sure you're okay with God. Is that all right? So I want you to take a moment and listen to what I'm going to say to you. Very important. What makes you, answer this question in your heart, what makes you think that if you died in the next few moments that you'd go to heaven? Just answer that question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God, but be honest. Don't just stare at me. Answer the question in your heart. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Listen, let's talk about some of your answers. Because your answers really define where you're at with God. Some of you said these words. Pastor Jim, I think I'm okay with God. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven like whoever is the most positive thinker. You won't find that in the Bible. Some of you may have answered and said, hey, I hope that if I died, I, I hope I'm okay. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible, again, does it say you get to go to heaven because you're, you have hope in your heart you're going to make it. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God. It's not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible because you love God, you get to go to heaven and have eternal life. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to stop playing games and tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven unless you do it God's way. In fact, Jesus makes this statement. Jesus himself He says, no man goes to the Father except by me. Do you know what he just said? You can't get there your way or my way. You can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture, exactly in the scripture how to get there. Some of you might have answered that question and said, well, my mom and dad told me I was a Christian since I was a kid. I've always thought of myself as a Christian great. You might say to me, well, Pastor Jim, you know, they took me to catechism class when I was a child or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. 
put a cross or St. Christopher around my neck, have me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Hey, that's great. But can I tell you, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, it's not in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say because your mom and dad told you a Christian makes you a Christian. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible. Put cross around you, St. Christopher. Nowhere, it's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you, you don't understand. I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I was there for years. I sang in the choir. I was a leader. I taught Sunday school. I helped the pastor out, counted the offerings. I was a leader in that church. Can I tell you something? That won't get you to heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. There's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus' way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. Stop and think about it. The one who's a beaten, bloody mess, nailed to the cross, raised from the dead on the third day. The tomb is empty, seated at the right hand of the Father now, proved to be the Son of God so that you can go to heaven, just leaves it up to you that whatever you think is okay, whatever they think is okay, whatever they think is okay, come on, don't treat God like he's an idiot. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture, and you're not going to get there any other way but his. In John, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking. He says these words, you must be born again. You must be born again. Now, a lot of people don't know what born again means. All we know about being born again is what Hollywood's told us or what television or movies have told us. They portray born again people as idiots and radicals and fanaticals and crazy people, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. What does born again mean? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, listen to this, listen to this. He says, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? Here's what he really just said. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. What's lukewarm? Let me define it so we're all on the same page. What's lukewarm? A little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. God is something, but he's not everything. You're not against God, here's lukewarm. But you're not wholehearted for God, that's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. So guys, here we are. He makes a statement. If I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. For every single one of us that are in here, we're going to have to make that decision of getting right with Jesus. Don't let anything in these sections back here disturb you from what's being said to you right now. Believe me. <laughs> Don't let anything stop you from hearing the word of the Lord. Everybody remain seated. It's just so disrespectful to the Holy Spirit when you get up and walk out in the middle of an altar call like this where people's lives are at stake. Let's learn some good church etiquette. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Let's talk just for a moment. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's just the way it is. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, 
bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus just in my head. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven. Watch this. And denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Remember he said, if you confess me before where? A man. I'm a man. I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my father. Tonight, this, this afternoon, is your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I am speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, I'm speaking to you. Make sure. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Someone will see me, the people I came with. Yep. People behind you. Yep. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. I hope you're not that dumb. I believe you're not. God wants to do something great in your future, but you're going to have to give him all of your heart. I already know you know who he is in your head, but that won't get you to heaven. It's about your heart. Are you following me? I already know you know who Jesus is. Even the devil knows who Jesus is. That doesn't mean he's going to heaven. So you already have head knowledge. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. It's your call. It's your choice. I love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to not play religious games, but to tell you like it is and tell you the truth. You need to be born again. You need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. You don't need to go to hell. You need to go to heaven. Now the call is yours. I've done my job. I'm counting. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty, fifty-one, fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, fifty-nine, sixty, sixty-one, sixty-two, sixty-three, sixty-four, sixty-five, sixty-six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight, sixty-nine, 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 sixty-
SPT and you're not doing anything, get up here. We need all the SPTs, right, Pastor Dave? Hey, all of you in front, listen to this. Listen to this. I want you to look over here to my, my right, your left, and I want you to see this guy. This guy waving at you, his name is Pastor Dave. He's going to do three things. I want you to be ready for the three things he's going to do. He's going to knock the snot right out of you. You know what I'm talking about? And wait a minute, put a smile on your face. You guys look like you're going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus. He's not, I was kidding when I said knock this snot out. I was kidding. Some of you are looking at me like, are you sure? But he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. First thing you got to understand, Jesus doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes into your heart because you invite him. He's a gentleman and won't come in unless you let him in. It's your heart, you got to give it to him. Are you following me? That's the first thing. Second thing, he's going to give you some free information about what to do next. Don't we love the word free in San Bernardino? It's free. And, and what it'll do is it'll tell you about what to do next. Is that okay? Now that you're a Christian, what to do? Simple, easy reading stuff. Is that okay? Third, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Now, Spiritual Personal Trainers are friends. Someone will meet you before church service. Get this. Buy you coffee, tea, nachos, turkey, lobster, shrimp, whatever it is, you know, and go over scripture with you and help you get strong in Jesus. Why, 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 why do we do this? We don't want you to fall away. We don't want you to fall through the cracks. We don't want you to go back. We want to help you get strong. Remember the blessings I said are yours, and if you need to know how to access them, or you'll be as broke tomorrow as you are today. Well, there's so many people that are Christians that are just down and out. They're going to go to heaven, but they never live the life they could have lived. Let us help you get into the place where you're going to get blessed and live the life that God paid for for you to live. Will you let us do that? And that's what an SBT is all about. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Come on, the people you waited for, the people you came with, they'll wait for you. It only takes a few moments. Give them a great big hand as they go. Come on, you can do better than that. Okay, one more great big praise. Come on. Yeah. 